Welcome to Every Step Podcast. I'm Christina Weston. And I'm Judith Beck. Every Step is the podcast where career and life meet. Hey, Judith, how are you feeling today? Oh, well, I'm good. I'm good. It's a beautiful day, so I'm glad to be here. Got a but bit of a got a voice today. Yeah, I know. That's not great. Have to give that that chatting a bit of a bit of a break, which I'm not sure is really possible. But uh, let's have a crack. <laughs> so, Judith, today the topics we're going to cover off are: is having kids killing your career? We're going to talk about career cushioning, and we're also going to have a chat about startup founders and their mental health. There's been some bit of research that's come out recently. So let's get stuck straight into our first topic, having kids killing your career. So I think a lot of women, well, not a lot of women, there are women, let's say, put it that way, that are making the decision to choose their career over having kids. They're making a choice to say kids aren't part of my life because, well, a whole range of reasons could be any reason But um, we're seeing fertility rates down in a lot of countries. We're seeing women who do have children tend to be a little bit older. So that's a really challenging trend, I think, for for governments as well, because if we've got an aging population and not many people coming through, we're not going to have the workers as the taxpayers funding the social security benefits and things that we have now so there's you know the fertility rates being down and people making families couples making decided or making decisions specific decisions not to have children is um is a really interesting and potentially troublesome trend what do you make of it Judith? well you know i kind of think that you know there's a lot of different reasons why people choose not to um have children and is it because they want to have a career or is it because of other things like one it's very expensive it is and you know and also you might want to put off having your family until you get your career going and you sort of get established and that's probably the reason that a lot of women are older I agree. Yeah. They might not even find their life partner. So they don't, they don't want to start a family until they do. And that might be later because it's different than what it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, So it could be a whole bunch of reasons. I know I read an article not uh, long ago about, it was Lily Allen who (laughs) said that, you know, she loves her kids, but she joked that they've totally ruined her career. Yeah, I mean that was a joke, but I know yeah. I know it was a joke, but it was kind of like, well, I I um I did I didn't my singing career got put on hold because I had kids, and I thought I, when I read the article, even though it was a joke, I thought kids don't kill a career, or kids only if you choose to go down that road of putting your career um, to the side while you're raising your kids, because you can do I I seen many 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 women do both and it's really about financial means like she would have financial means like i mean child life. care is stupidly expensive in in any country um you know australia it's outrageous and and yeah it is there are there are decisions to be made there and it does it does women do have to make decisions and sometimes it's like you said they can't they can't afford to do childcare so they do step back from work it's i think it's a really individual choice and also too you know like we got to stop putting guilt trips on women Absolutely. about you know that they that they have to do this or they have to do that i mean i you know i come from a family of five girls and they've all been successful in their careers and i remember one one of my sisters who, you know, has three very well-adjusted kids who have now gone off into successful careers themselves. Um, you know, she, when she was, when she, her kids were young, she had a, um, a housekeeper who came in and who actually kind of became like a, a pseudo grandmother as well, because she was so loved by the family. But like she would, she would um, come early in the morning 
uh, take care of the kids during the day, have dinner ready. And then when the two, when my sister and brother came home, they all sat down. It was quality, not quantity. And, and that, and, and it was a really good, now she had the, she had the financial means to do that, but she wasn't, but she wasn't ultra wealthy. It was still at the beginning of her career. So, and the kids were babies and young. She had a good career and many, many people would be that way. And that was very fortunate for her, but you've got to, you've got to actually focus on how you're going to do it. You, you can have it all, but you just can't do it all. And to say that you can't have a successful career or you didn't have the career because I decided to look after my kids actually makes other women feel guilty. You know, it actually makes other women think, oh, okay, am I supposed to not work? Because if I do work, then my kids are going to. Um... Oh, it's, you know, it's such an individual choice. And I don't think we should be guilting or shaming anybody for their decision. If that's a decision not to have children, for whatever reason, I know some people, some couples that are making decisions not to have children because they don't want to bring children into a world where there's global warming and all sorts of other issues going on. So they're making those decisions. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't be shaming anybody for the decision to have a career. And I remember feeling really challenged in terms of being a young mum and I was eager to go back to work but I, I really felt guilty when I was um when I was at work especially when I wasn't enjoying my job thinking I should be with my child but it, you know we shouldn't be shaming anybody or making anybody feel bad for whatever decision they make it's their choice it's their choice and you don't know all the circumstances and let's face it not everybody's meant to be a parent yeah they they may be good at being something else. And, you know, then you see people who have, you know, five or six kids and they're the most awesome parents and they love kids and they're great at nurturing and caring. And that's great for them too. So just like women or fathers who choose to stay at home with the kids, we shouldn't judge them and say, oh, they don't have a career. They don't, they're not working because they're working very hard (laughs) at raising their family. And same as the women and the men who go to work and choose not to have a big family or family at all, it's their choice. We got to yeah. stop being so judgmental all the time. It's really interesting because um, companies are now having conversations around uh, fertility and families. I've just seen today actually was brought to my attention. Uh, Google have announced um, where their managing director here announced for people working across Sydney, Melbourne or Auckland or who work remotely are now able to get reimbursed for and support with elective egg freezing, IVF, adoption and surrogacy to help them with starting or growing their family. So that's a that's a really interesting thing for Google to be doing in terms of supporting financially families to actually help them with growing their family. I think that's a really interesting initiative. That's a great initiative because the, the, um, I mean, I, over the years have seen so many friends and and people who have worked for me as well, who have gone through IVF a number of times and it's so costly. It's expensive. It's ridiculous. Not only is is it a a horrific emotional journey for a couple, but yeah, it's financially devastating because each round is really costly. Exactly. And a lot of times people wouldn't tell their employer that they're going through IVF. No, so they don't know the struggles that they're going through or the emotional impact that they might have when it doesn't work. And so if the company knows and they're aware, then they can they can be more supportive and more empathetic when someone is going through. And and when you know, I can't express enough that when you are bonded to your organization because they've taken time to care about you and support you, they're going to be a loyal and productive employee absolutely for the long term. Yeah. They're going to tell all their friends, they're going to be happy where they're at, they're going to go, they're going to think twice about going somewhere else um, if they're headhunted because they're going to think, now this company has got my back. And And this has got to be a retention acquisition and retention strategy, doesn't it? Because why else would an organization do do this for for their people? 
yeah. this is once again another example where work and life are being collapsed into each other. We've got this real merging now where employers are taking far more interest seemingly in our personal lives. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm look at the moral of the story is to have kids or not to have kids. It's a personal choice. It only in, it, it only impacts your career if you let it. And, you know, and it only in, impacts the, the raising of your children if you let it. You know, in other words, it's up to you how you organize yourself and organize the process and and get support and do what's right and good for you and do what's right and good for the kids because if you're working the kids aren't going to be disadvantaged unless there's no quality yeah unless there's no care and there's you know, yeah I mean I think there are some challenges we're really talking about more affluent families with parents who are executives but if if the parents uh, don't have high paying careers, you know, let's face it, the cost of childcare, you're actually bringing home virtually nothing extra after tax art, or sometimes even you're paying the childcare centre to go for the privilege of, of going to work. Yeah. So a lot of people will make that decision to stay at home. And I mean, there are enormous numbers of statistics that talk about the lack of superannuation that women have as a result of the fact that they hadn't been in the workforce as long because they took time out to have children. And yes, women do have periods of time if they make those decisions that do have to come back and build up their career. So there are, you know, there are real uh, consequences if you choose to stay at home. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that without the right intention and the right coaching and the right mentorship that you can't pick up those lost years by showing a level of aptitude and interest and, and engagement in, in the work that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's, that's the, the key, having the right support and the right people behind you that can advise you and that can help you through the process. Because really, I mean, when you and I were starting out, we didn't have any, we didn't have anything to look at. We couldn't just Google stuff and what do we do and what, how yeah. this, it was really who's ever was in our little group, isolated group at the time, rather than this global type mm. and, uh, support, but it's only going to benefit you if you take advantage of it. Yeah. Cause I think the biggest, the biggest issue is our own competence. It's if we've been out of the workforce for a number of years, we kind of have this imposter syndrome and it's like, well, I'm not, I'm not able, I'm not clever enough or I'm, I'm not up to date. And that's all our own BS in our heads because the stuff is actually, there's a lot of stuff in business and in leadership and in management that is common sense. And if you've got common sense, everything else will take care of itself. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Okay, Judith, let's jump to the next subject. Career cushioning. There's this term that's come out of nowhere called career cushioning. And I think it's really about trying to make sure that you've got a plan B if something goes wrong. And I don't know why this term has suddenly been coined because from my perspective, isn't that what you do in your career? Like your career is never certain. You never know when the next restructure is going to be. And for me, it's just a fundamental thing around having your networks and making your CV, making sure your CV is up to date and uh, being engaged with other organisations and having conversations with other execs and other organisations to maintain your networks because you never know where your next opportunity is coming from. So I don't know why this whole career cushioning term has just kind of popped up, popped up out there's, of nowhere. There's always new buzzwords for yeah. the whole thing coming up every day. I mean, this is just simply plan B. And, yeah. you know, we've always said you got to have a plan B. And even, you know, how we, in our last um, episode where we were talking about uh, would you work for a company where you didn't like their brand or what they were doing? Well, we had a lot of people come back to us and uh, with comments about that. And even on a Swellcast, for those of you who aren't familiar with Swellcast, it's an it's an app where you can talk talk to people in groups um, like mini podcast. And so we get people that make comments over there. And one of the comments was basically, well, um, it's not that easy just to break away from an employer that you don't like because 
financially it's not possible. Sure. And, you know, we're kind of stuck in a rut kind of thing. So, um, and, and what I've always said with everything from every part of your career, from your 20s, 30s, 40s, all through your whole career journey, you need to have a plan B and you need to be ready for anything because it's not just about whether or not you like your employer, your boss or whatever. It could be You might be made redundant. Who knows? Yeah, anything. And And what does a plan B mean? Well, a plan B means that you've got to have a process. You've got to have your resume ready. You've got to um, uh, really sort of do an analysis of what it is that I want to do. Keep doing a reanalysis of what you want to do every single year. Do I like where I'm at? Where am I going? How do I get there? What skills do I need? And that's and key. The whole skills, I think, is skills. really key. That's right. So you've got to put put that plan in place. And then you've got the, um, so you've got the people who want to work in corporate life. And so they've got to have that plan B of, of what I just said. And then you've got the people who think, I don't want corporate life. I want to um, start my own business. And that's where it used to be called side hustle, right? <laughs> so remember yep. that remember that term a couple of years ago, side yep. hustle? Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a little bit of a twist, different twist on it. But if you are someone who wants to do a side hustle or start your own business, you know, you can do that while you're working, not at work, but you can put the building blocks in place because there's a lot of administration behind starting a new business. There's a lot of things like your website and you're getting your product together, doing analysis on it, testing the market, finding out before you leave your full-time position that will get you going and um one of the things you got to make sure you're not doing that during your normal work hours that's exactly but right it's a weekend thing because you don't want to jeopardize your current position now i don't know if you're watching food star so mm. food star is with with uh, gordon ramsay and um janice J J the lady from boost juice janice ellis oh yes is, I, I think I've got her name somewhat right. Anyway, in America, they'll have a similar one with probably some someone else. But it's virtually about, um, it's kind of like uh, The Apprentice, but for small business people who want to um, launch their food idea or the food product idea. And there's a whole bunch of really cool ones. And then what happens is they get in, uh, Gordon and Janice get... A team of eight and then they put them to the test of these different things like you know uh, have this launch for this product or do and this and they have to work as a team now the reason why I'm mentioning it because anyone who's looking to career cushion or to start their own business that kind of a show it is just I love watching them because everybody in those teams is everybody that you see in a business and as little, and they're small business owners, some of the things that um, Janine Ellis, she's so smart and she's got all, like thousands of boost juice all over the world. Of course, Gordon Ramsay has hundreds of restaurants around the world. So they obviously have done something really good and they would be uh, great mentors because the winner wins 250,000 and wow. their mentor mentorship. So they have these things where all these people are supposed to be small business, but when they get in a group, half of them haven't got a clue what to do, or they're not working in a group because one of the things that really hit home was it's about when you're career cushioning and you're looking at starting a business is putting yourself in the shoes of the customer. Because a lot of these um, uh, uh, things that they've been doing when they when they're going through the the exercises of the team, they do it all. They project management, get it out there. The product's ready to go. The event's ready to go. But they don't sit back and think, "What's the customer going to think about this?" And that's critical, right? If you don't have product market fit, or if you're not appealing to your customer, if you haven't managed the customer journey, that's a fail, right? That's a complete fail. It's a big fail. And the thing is, is that if you leave your job because you think you're going to go out and launch this new product 
and you haven't looked at all the different things that you need to do to be successful as a small business owner, you, you could be looking at no income for for a long time. Or well, that's, that's a really good segue, Judith, to, to the third topic that we wanted to kind of cover off, which is uh, startups and the mental health of founders. And I think the issue is in part because people haven't done their homework, they haven't done their research, or they don't have the, they underestimate the entirety of the business skills that they need to, to go into a business on their own. Um, the, the bit of research, so this is an article that came out in a, um, um, an online newsletter that I subscribe to called Sifted because I'm in the in the startup entrepreneurial kind of space. And the people from Sifted recently did a, a, a review or a study and interviewed a whole bunch of startups and founders. And they found that 45% of founders recently told them that their mental health was bad or very bad right now. And that many founders were pushed to the absolute brink in the last year. Um, that's a really big statistic of people that are struggling in business for a whole range of reasons. Some of those are economic, you know, we've had a really high interest rate environment. Um, people aren't spending in the way that they were. VCs have pulled back money. Um, we're, we're still finding our feet post COVID, the things that were on an up and up pre COVID are not so much on the up and up now. In fact, there's, there's challenges for a whole bunch of reasons. So we've got all these founders who have come in and it's hard. It's hard. It's hard juggling your personal life alongside your career or your business life. The two get collapsed in together uh you want to push and because you want to be successful so you push and you push and you push and you put your personal health on the line because you're pushing so hard you won't give yourself a holiday how i'm speaking from experience here um you don't give yourself a holiday because you're guilty to take a holiday when you think you should be working because there's not enough income coming in the door so how could you possibly be entitled to a, a holiday or to spoil yourself so it's it's really really challenging being being a startup founder, um, and there's a whole bunch of additional things that I think founders need to consider. One before they walk away from a stable job, um, and you know before they actually take on whatever it is that their passion passion play is. It's a bumpy road. And you've been well, there too, Judith. You've been well, there too. Well, yeah, I've been there too. And, you know, the thing is, is that even looking at the, the people in the show, there's not one person on either of these two teams that I would go, they've got it all together. They've, they've, because what people need to realize when they start their own business is that you need to know a lot of, a lot about a lot of different things. And if you don't have a strength in something, You've got to prepare, be prepared to get somebody in to do it for you, or you're going to be trying to do way too much. And that's where that burnout comes from. That's right. You know, it's very, you know, you can't the I mean, one of the one of the things that I always had when I started my businesses is that um that there's no way I'm going to work on the weekend. It was just a rule for me. And there's no way that any of my staff are going to work on the weekend either, unless we were doing conferences, was, which was yeah. 25 years later. That's a whole different ballgame. But in the early days, it's like, okay, um, and sa same with consultants. Work like hell during the week. You know, you need to get, I, I want you focused at work. Work like hell during the week. But you need to take your weekends off because your families and you don't want, because once stress comes in with, you um, lack of family time and things like that it affects their their work oh but what i've noticed with, with the with small business owners is that um and especially watching the show because it highlights the fact that you have to have mentorship and people who have been there done that in your corner saying being the fresh eye being yeah. the absolute fresh eye and going now that's you know what like for instance they had to do this box of 
you know how you buy your 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 meals online and they deliver them in a <laughs> box and it's got all the ingredients in them yeah 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 we've got those take, services here yep. yep it's supposed to take 30 minutes to cook well they had to prepare the prepare the menu and prepare the instructions well the girl who was in charge of preparing the menu with the with the graphic designer got one of the steps wrong out mm. of sync with the pictures and so when um, she was being confronted about it, she wanted to make big excuses. So basically that team lost because yep. people got confused what steps they were going through. And when she was being confronted uh, by Janine, you know, she's like wanting to make, well, you know, they could have figured it out or they could have. And the thing is when you're a small business, those mistakes can be the end, can be the end. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I've heard and I've had experience with people in small business saying, oh, don't worry about it. Just focus on the 20 percent. Forget about the 80 percent. No, when you're in a small business, you got to focus on the detail because you don't get a second chance. That's exactly. That's exactly. <laughs> and, you know, that mentorship piece is 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 really critical. And it's that support to know when to keep going. And it's also the support to actually understand when to walk away. Uh, another thing in this survey from Sifted was that 49% of respondents to their recently to their recent survey said they're considering leaving their startups or you know walking away or shutting down their their businesses and i think there's this stigma attached to to closing your doors and i, I think we we need to be better at uh framing failure in a different way as as a as a learning um and as as an achievement and having the courage to say actually it's time it's time to move on now um and to take that that stigma away from it i think there's there's almost a little bit too much um we've got a you know fall over the the finish line you know dead almost to be successful and i think there's as much power in understanding when it's time to walk away and and save your marriages your relationships your friendships your health because these times are super super stressful um knowing when to say enough is enough because most startups do not are not successful that's exactly right and the first three to five years is a big indicator and that and that's also another thing about the career cushioning side it starts saving for the rainy day mm. or saving for um that launch or to make sure because chances are in the first six months maybe even a year you might not make a lot of money might you know it, you it will take you so you need to and that was one thing that I always did early in the career and soon as I could do it soon as the business was getting going um and I would say probably that was after about the third year um I started socking away money into the rainy day account and I always had a year's overhead and yeah. because there's always peaks and troughs in um in the you know in the economy there's always going to be peaks and troughs no matter what business that you're in there's always going to be those peaks and troughs and you've got to save for that rainy day so you don't come under pressure to lower your fees, lower your the price of your goods. I never had to lower our fees ever. And that always did, uh, it, it uh, held me in good stead because once you lower them, it's hard to get them back up. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, you're not, you're not reducing the service. So why do, should you lower your fees? But this is where I think um, small business owners and people thinking about this, well, there's one, yeah. they need to have support. You need to have support. Stop it's always going to take, going to take longer than you think. And it's going to cost more than you expected. And you're going to be doing things and a lot of, and a lot of corporate people don't get this when corporate people go cut, leave corporate and then start their own business. But they've been used to having people around them. They forget <laughs> that it's up to them to turn the lights off and turn them on and do the accounts and do all that stuff which they hate to do yeah you got to do your own zero you got to do your own bass you got to do you know your own cups of tea <laughs> that's exactly and you start letting those things slide it will start to affect so you have to be prepared to be the basically the jack of all trades for a while and and not think that you're above it 
that you're above doing it. And then as soon as you have enough money to be able to pay someone, like one of the things I probably would do is I would be paying someone to do my social media, especially if I was, um, you know, an older person that wasn't in, inclined to doing because the younger the younger ones can do that social media so quickly and uh, like a hundred times better. So if you can direct someone to do your social media under your guidance, because you want to make sure your brand is is um, taken care of and that they're doing the right thing, get somebody to do that one. Get someone get someone to do your accounting or your books when you can do that. There are things that you can delegate that people are better than you are, but you've you've got to under. But in the beginning. In the beginning, you're not going to have the money to be able to you're do that. You're not. So you're going to have to do it all yourself you're or with yourself. your co-founders or divvy it up with your co-founder or co-founders. And you need to make sure that between you, you've got the skills to get the job done because it's and not, not straightforward. And that's not such a bad thing either because then you're learning every single function within the company that you do um, delegate later on and you'll and you'll understand what that process is so you know don't think of it as a long-term thing but if you're 10 years into your business and you're being burnt out and you still don't have any um I'd say even five years and you still don't have any weekends or you're doing something wrong it's something wrong you're doing something wrong yeah you, you gotta have a look if you're not bringing the money in like Christina said it's the mature brave person that can say this is not working it's time to shut the doors and because I'm not going to lose my house and my life savings and everything else to keep this going if you can't see light at the end of the tunnel yeah you know, that's and great. that's when you really need to have a good mentor and talk to other people so that you can get the right guidance, you know, because there always is that, am I just on the precipice? And I think that sometimes uh, it can sometimes be the truth, but it's often the illusion. I'm just on the precipice. I'm just around the next corner. I'm going to make it big. I'm going to be the next unicorn. You know, those scenarios are few and far between. So make sure you get somebody that's independent, not a mate who's going to tell you what they think you want to hear, get somebody independent, call, reach out to another fellow entrepreneur and tell them you're at a crossroads and ask for their counsel. Absolutely. I used to tell people, look, get, sure, get, get the views of your friends and your family. That's fine. But find the most negative people you can <laughs> to give you their view on your product or your service or whatever, because they they will tell you things you don't want to hear and that's those are the things that you should hear but you've got to be prepared to listen not like the person, not like that person well. in the show that got all defensive and said oh but 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 no absolutely i mean there's several on that show that are you know like they it's everything all the problems and with one gordon ramsay said all you do is talk about all the problems with no solutions. Does that sound like <laughs> all the problems with no solutions? And you know, and you can't be that person because especially if you want to be a leader. So, you know, they've got and then they have, oh, the other one I love. Uh, he got let go last night. He was the person where she saw, Janine saw that he didn't contribute. So remember when we were talking about, and I was saying in one of the episodes that. When people get made redundant, uh, when companies go through a big redundancies, there's this whole group of people who think I'm just going to sit back and shut up and not do anything, and then I'll be okay. I won't be. And those are the ones that end up getting made redundant because they're the invisible ones. So she said to him, "You know, you didn't do anything wrong, but you didn't do anything. Mm. You didn't contribute. So therefore." I'm not going to invest in your business. And, you know, and that's true. Well, you know, at least if you make a mistake, at least you spoke up and tried. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. tried. And that, and so that, that I think is, um, you know, this, like those types of shows I love because you do learn some business things on it and you get to see people in, in a real life situation trying to promote their business 
and how they do, it's quite interesting. Yeah, and you get the insights of the mentors as well and see what their perspective is from a real-world perspective because they're simulating real-world real scenarios. Absolutely, and they are smart. And, and really, the two businesses, restaurant businesses and juice business... They're hard businesses. Oh, they're hard, hard businesses. That's so anything hard. with food. I think anything with food is a hard business. Any business is a hard business. Forget about whether it's food. Anything's a hard business. Absolutely. And highly competitive. Mm. So they know what they're talking about. And um, and that's just the moral of the story. You know, find people that know what they're talking about that will help you mm. and give you some guidance. And don't think that you know it all because you never know it all. You never know it all. all. So look, keep a learning mindset. Keep enhancing and improving your skills and surround yourself with people and find mentors that can help you. Seems to be a common theme in terms of our advice, Judith. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, I mean, really, if people don't get that, I don't understand, like, seriously. But, um, you know, there are people who who will think, no, I, I know what I'm talking about. And that's, that's fine of passion, if you've got that passion. But if you don't seek out some advice or some guidance then you don't even know you know what the other um you know what other people think and you still may go and do it your own way and go no no i'm gonna do it my way but it's that's fine that's fine but don't be blinded i have this expression i have a family member and we've um we've nicknamed this family member and ask ask whole and the reason why we've nicknamed this family member that I won't I won't say it too quickly because it may come out the wrong way is because this person always comes and asks lots and lots of questions about what they should do in this business scenario and that business scenario and this situation with this problem and the other problem. And then this person goes off and does exactly what we told this person not to do in the first place. And the outcome is exactly as we predicted because we've got just a smidgen more business experience than this particular person. So there you go, folks. A new expression, an ask hole. A person <laughs> who asks lots and lots of questions but never takes your advice. You know, I wonder, I'm, I wonder, I mean, we, we've we seen that over the years as far as, you know, you kind of go, it, it'd be fr it's frustrating to me if the same question gets asked several times and and the advice isn't taken and you do kind of go well what are they thinking they're thinking is the advice too hard so in part, other words part of it's they don't know how to um, they're intimidated by the advice because they don't have the skills to process the advice and act on it okay so that's yeah <laughs> Well, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they got to live and die by the sword, I guess. Their own. Correct. You stop <laughs> giving advice after a while, don't you? There's just no point wasting your breath. I'd rather have a drink with them than <laughs> a business conversation with them. Hey, I know that this wasn't one of our topics, but it, I just remembered that um, you had sent me something about Sam Moyston and the governor general appointment. Mm -hmm. And that article about with from that journalist that was just scathing, yeah. um, which I was very surprised. And you know, I my view. So for those of you who are listening that from other countries, from America, there's a governor general that gets appointed by the king under the recommendation of the prime minister. And so they've just appointed appointed a lady who will start in July by the name of Sam Moyston. Um, and she's the second female who has who has gotten the position. And a female journalist came out and wrote an article that was scathing about her and about her background and everything else. So she's been pro she's been pro quotas, and I think that's part of the part of what this journalist was worried about. She was more she wanted a meritocracy as opposed to quotas so and, and that was only one of the reasons that she gave well but, i mean yeah the, the from what i understand that position needs to be bipartisan anyway and they need and it's more of a figurehead kind of thing they go to functions and do you know they appearances and that kind of stuff my thing is because what i thought i thought okay because i went and looked at her background i didn't really know what her a really good was. background and i looked at it as as a <laughs> previous headhunter 
trying to um, headhunt somebody for a CEO role because that's the level that we did. And so I looked at it and I thought, come back. She's a lawyer. She, you know, she worked in government. She worked in all these different things, and she's on been on boards. And you know, her her background looks really good. And I thought to myself, did the journalist go up, go and look at the background of the current governor general and compare or any of the other ones? Now, his background- It might have just been clickbait. Who knows? It's kind of, but it was a pretty scathing article. It was. It was a scathing article. And I thought to myself, when are we just going to, like, why do we have to have, because the, the person who's in it now, he's got a very admirable um, background too, and he's been um, general in the military and all these different, account, you know, things that he's had. So he's he's got a great background too. But one of the things she said in her article was something like, um, well, she's never even managed a p and &L, &L, and yeah. and all she's had is a group executive role within a major finance this financial organ and do you know how senior that role is a pretty group, senior pretty darn senior right and and i thought well okay so where did he run a PL? yeah i don't i don't know maybe it was just trying to get trying to sensationalize an appointment and and look it might have been politically motivated because i think sam moiston might have been pro the the voice vote and so there's there, i think it's all being politicized to be honest it probably has but it's kind of like when are we going to get to this thing where okay if someone gets appointed just say good for you you got the job now let's see how you do yeah and if you don't do a good job then we'll criticize you yeah. doing a bad job but <laughs> you know, like starting out it's this negativity yeah that's and it's like, good for you, Sam, for getting it. I hope yeah, you absolutely. I would have questioned more if I was the journalist why we need the position. Oh well, that's a whole other story. No, she's exactly. actually. I think she's pro the republic as well. So it's really interesting that she's taken a position representing the king when I think she's pro republic. So well, anyway, there and, there's, and there's like a staff of like eighty um, that go with that, from what I saw on the internet, and also. Salary levels about um, well, they quoted like four seventy five plus. You get to live in this beautiful house if you want to, and all this other stuff. You and get everything to else, car, yeah. yeah, the cars and all. But it's kind of, and the travel, and you sort of think that's a lot of taxpayers' money. Mm. And what do we need that for? That would be the question. That's a completely other conversation that we've had referendums on and hasn't passed muster for whatever yeah. reason. So hey, talk yeah. about career cushioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like on that note. On that note. <laughs> we'll see you all next. Oh, well, you'll hear us. I keep saying see, and we don't see people. We I they know. hear us. Oh gosh. I know. Bye. Bye. <laughs> see you later. For more information about every step and our guests, head to everysteppodcast.com. To be notified of new podcasts, please subscribe via your favorite listening platform. And of course, follow us on social media and direct message us to share your ideas about guests or topics.